Anyway, so we have 45 minutes now that uh, all of us has opened a huge can of work. To the thank you very much to the three panelists. Uh, my my first question is, uh, what are the economic platform of the USDP and the NLD? And if they do not have the economic platform, what are your views, each one of you, on on the economic development strategy for for Myanmar in the years to come? And are you social democrat, welfare state, or are you a liberal democrat for the capitalist, unfettered uh, economy and so on? Thank you. We didn't actually uh, hear anything about the military themselves as an institution. Uh, I would just ask one uh, long-term question. Is it fair to say that uh, the military are the only institution that holds the country together and the government together? And therefore, if, if that is the case, uh, what do you see in the future? I mean, is there a new generation of military that uh, would have a different way of thinking, that would accept some sort of diminished role of the military in the state? And would that have any consequences on the, on the unity of the country? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I come from Myanmar, teaching ASEAN studies at the Bangkok University International College. As a Myanmar citizen, no matter whoever is the election winner, we need to rebuild the country with a new generation, new blood. So is it possible to have somehow to have the hijacking the, the new military with the civilian, with the like-minded, educated people, with the international observers, like the ad hoc commission to rebuild the country, to shape the countries, as the most of the NLT members are no experience for the bureaucracy and that we have shot off politicians. So is it possible to have ad hoc commission with the international community, observers, and like-minded? I know that there are so many new generation military young men, they don't like their management. Is it possible to have the institution like that, an ad hoc commission like that? Thank you. Well, so far they have not published. So in terms of revealed preference, you can't tell. But I think it's more of the same for many. But there is a hint like NLD would be much talking about equity issues. So they could be seen as a social democrat, I would say, in terms of economic policies. Uh, they would be much more critical about foreign investment, I would guess. And that, that is the fear, right? But it depends, again, on, on actually how, what do you want out of development? Growth, equity, stability, the EGS thing which I used to talk about. Equity come first or growth come first or stability. Stability means volatility of the money and things. You know, when you go on a market economy, volatility is unavoidable to a certain extent. Inflation is unavoidable to a certain extent. The lever curves may not work. The Phillips curve may not work. So uh, it is very difficult. And Vietnam has gone through that devaluation phase. Indonesia had happened in Indonesia too. And, and they had to Bottled through that. So the kind of uh, fall of the chart from, th from 800 plus to 1002, yes, it's huge, but still compared to what Dong have happened to Dong in the early years of Deng Moi. So, so that, that, that's another thing. So in that sense, I would say we don't know, but there will be no going back to socialism. Of course, there's no alternative. The only thing is how much is the state invention, intervention, how much is the private sector uh, kind of uh, freedom or, or helping out the private sector in a way. That, that's, that's the issue. Uh, regarding the military, yeah, we, because if you want to talk about military, it will be another forum, I would say. But anyway, so far the commander in chief says that he will not, uh, he will ensure that there's a, going to be a free and fair, fair election and will abide by the results. Uh, Yes, um, the withdrawal thing, he also said that, I mean, in the interview with BBC, something like, I mean, I can't exactly say, uh, that there, uh, it is imperative that there would be peace and disarmament of the armed uh, ethnic organization before military could consider it safe and stable enough in the government not to be uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the parliament. So that, that's how it, so as he said, he may take five years or ten years, you never know, but the ball is on the other side court, the ethnic armed organizations. Uh, I think that is thing. And of course, uh, the question of the military autonomy issue, that's a constitutional issue too. Virtually, yeah, it is intact and probably would be intact until 2020. 
regarding the, the question about the special non-elected commission, it's a very leer, tempting idea to have a kind of a bureaucrats running it. it, it Again, our friend Thailand has done that in the past uh, um, for a short period. But I think under the present politicized charge atmosphere, it is almost impossible. And this thing about the myth about not having enough qualified people. What do you mean by qualification? What do you need to become a president? What do you need to become a minister? Uh, because basically nobody had experience because of the way the country is run in politics has been run for the last 60 years. Nobody had a chance to take a... Even Ronald Reagan, though he was a B-class actor, he was a governor before that, right? So in that sense, we don't have, yes, that's true. But doesn't mean it will stay forever like that, have to stay forever and get the, come from the old, old little um, getting to the bottom of the, of the barrel and scraping up the same old, old people molded under the system. It is, I think it's, we have to go through a bit of a learning experience, learn very fast. And we have to trust trust the people, trust the, uh, uh, the, the pyramid form of the, the top leader and the rest of the people following should not be the case in democracy. It should be a barrel shape, be a barrel preferably. Uh, that, that's what I see. It. And, and the thing of ability to run huge military units is completely different from ability to run a diverse country because, that's, because the other thing you can run by command and order. So that not necessarily means you have a better position to run than a new fight who has just run his own family business. Thank you. You know, as uh, Sia Jo was saying, none of the 98 parties that are, uh, 89 parties that are running have published a manifesto. In fact, none of them really have any detailed policies on anything at all. Um, so the USDP has no economic policy, just like it has no policy on any other issue. But it's not noticed as much in the case of the USDP, because as some kind of incumbent, they can sort of claim whatever government policy is as their policy. Uh, the NLD uh, doesn't have any policies, but they've been pushed and asked many times, and they've finally come up with the skeleton of an economic policy, uh, which has been made public, I think, uh, or semi-public. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good document. Uh, it's sort of a series of headings of what they think is important in the economy. And it's about how you need, uh, you know, equitable growth, and you need growth that respects the environment, and you need, you know, a balance of uh, local and foreign uh, investment and all of these are good things, but it gives no indication of how you balance the different priorities and how you come up with an economic policy that can achieve those things. Everyone would love to have green growth as well as job promoting growth as well as uh, equitable growth, but how do you achieve it? And I think you know, that's been the big problem for Myanmar. There's been uh, a lack of a vision of what kind of economy Myanmar wants to have. Of course, it wants a free market economy. It doesn't want the old failed economy. It wants a new successful economy. But how do you get there? What, what's, the, what's the vision for that? And I think that's been lacking on the government side. It's certainly lacking on the, on the NLD side. Um, in terms of the military, I think, uh, you know, we have to remember where we came from five years ago, which was a country where the military held approximately 100% of the power, uh, and uh, they therefore were the ones who initiated and backed the transition. Uh, it couldn't have happened unless it was their idea and they supported it. And, and so in that sense, I think um, they, we're now in a middle ground where they've started this thing, uh, they're in favor of it, uh, and I think they have an end goal in mind. And I think the end goal that they have in mind is a country uh, where the military is incredibly powerful and is, and is respected, not because of constitutionally enshrined prerogatives, uh, and not because of the raw power of the gun, but because uh, it's a large uh, respected institution that is very much needed uh, by the country. Uh, and, and so I think they, they see a future where they are outside of, uh, outside of the legislature uh, and outside of politics and don't require you know, the, the, the kind of constitutional uh, privileges that they now have. But they're very unclear of what the path looks like from the current situation to that end goal. Uh, I think they're very comfortable with the end goal in the sense that it enables them to have a, what, what the commander in chief calls a standard military, a modern professional army that isn't involved in politics and isn't involved in internal fighting. It's it's there to protect the nation, uh, and and they think they would have you know much better international military relations if they could get to that stage. They would have access to international training, uh, Western weapon systems, and so on. All of the things that they think uh, they need to. Uh, to, to, to have force equivalents with, with regional countries. But, so the end goal is one I think that they are comfortable with in principle, but they have no real idea of how to get from here to there. I think that's the issue. 
Um, and I agree on the ad hoc commission. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very unlikely uh, prospect in the current political environment. Uh, there's only one political party that has sort of released uh, a clear economic policy, which is uh, quite ironic. The, uh, the National Unity Party, the, uh, the former Burmese, uh, the Burma Socialist Program Party, the, they, are, they, they have a clear policy of, of, of social welfare state. But if you ask all other political parties, they will come up with really contradictory uh, sort of, like you know, all the things the people would want to hear, from like you know, as Richard has rightly pointed out, from green growth to uh, the free market to all kinds of things. But a clear economic policy, only the National Unity Party and their policy, uh, the, the booklet, and no one has read. I mean, I, I read it quite a while ago. Uh, but other than that political party, uh, all other political parties, if you ask them, uh, we are all for the free market uh, economy. Uh, like uh, they cannot really, uh, the, I mean, at least to me, the, the people I have asked, the, the, they have not been able to really articulate what uh, their economic policies are in a very, very concrete manner. Um, the second question, uh, like, you know, I, I agree with everything uh, that uh, both Richard and Seattle ha have said. One thing, though, is like you know the the, the, the military is a domination role. Or like you know, you, we have started to see that in the last five years. Like uh, the, we, like uh, since around 1962, all we saw on TV. I mean, like you know, we started uh, having the, 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 the TV in the 70s, but on uh, newspapers, all green. Like you know, from 1988 to 2010. Like, you know, you, you only saw greens on uh, everywhere, uh, in the state media, outside, state functions, everywhere. But now, you hardly see them. Like, they have their own newspaper. Even then, like, you know, you don't uh, see military leaders uh, on, uh, in, uh, in their own newspapers or their own TV ch on their TV channel as much as we used to. In that sense, uh, like, uh, the, 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 they are, the, I mean, like, you know, they are playing less and less role in Myanmar society. And then the, I was telling you about the, some of the, uh, the surveys uh, I have conducted in ethnic minority areas. In all areas, with, with no exception, uh, well, one exception, that it's Kachin State, in all areas, what people said is, uh, the biggest change under this current administration, uh, uh, in all areas except Kachin State is, like we don't see, we don't have to, we don't have to be afraid of the soldiers anymore. So that is the answer. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't have to be well, our soldiers as much as we have, we used to. I should qualify. So that's what they said. And then, like a, a woman in Chen State, uh, the woman I interviewed in Chen State, that, that briefly, that should ex answer your question better. I asked her, like you know, how are the soldiers that are, like in your neighborhood? So oh, we don't see them that much anymore. But last month, a soldier from nearby battalion borrowed my motorcycle, and then he said only a couple of hours, and he did. Like, I didn't get it back for about a week, and then once he returned the motorcycle, it was like you know seriously damaged. So I went to talk to his battalion commander. The commander apologized and then repaired the entire uh, the, the, the motorcycle and paid for the expenses. And then he was very, very, the commander was very, very apologetic. People in, in that area in the past uh, would not have done that. So they end up like, uh, we have started to, uh, to, to, to see the changes. What we will have to, uh, to, to wait and see is whether the, such changes will continue or not. I think it will. But one thing is whether the military will play less and less role in, the, in politics. It depends on both sides, both the military and political parties. Uh, for, for, like, for, uh, polit political leaders, like you know, they right now is they will have to find, as I said earlier, a, a working relationship uh, with the army, and then like you know, they they all, they. they if they do, I mean, they will, they will, have, they will have to be critical of whatever they think they, they should be critical of. But at the same time, uh, they will, they will need to convince military leaders, at least uh, those uh, who who are taking the leading role, that 
They will not do anything that would rock the stability in the country. One last question. Again, I agree with both uh, uh, Richard and uh, Siatin has said, uh, have said, um, like you know, when it comes to experience, like you know, almost everything that the, both the government uh, the, and society are dealing with, we are we are we're doing almost everything in the new context. We're trying to do new things, so that the, the learning curve was is still quite steep. But at the same time, at, uh, as I said earlier, people are learning. People are learning to do uh, the, the, the right things. People are learning to deal with the situation. I think it will get better. This is a learning process. We should not go back to an easy solution and bring in unelected members and let them run. Like, you know, we all know that. that in 1958, the caretaker government did a pretty good job. So in 1962, people are now very critical of the, the new win government. Back then, people welcomed the, the, the coup. Many people. They thought that the, the new one would go back to the barracks after a couple of years, after he cleaned up the, uh, the country. But what, what we ended up with, we ended up with military uh, the, the different military governments for many decades. We would not want the repeat of that, so I would not go for uh, an, not a non elected commission running the country. The, the $64,000 question here is stability. Each has its own definition of stability. For some people, stability is dead calm. For some people, stability is choppy waters. And of course, it should not be a perfect storm. But you can't avoid choppy waters in the real world. That is the problem. What's this? Oh, I was just going to add on, on uh, my, um, I recently tried to address this question of where the NLD or how it was drawing up policy platforms. And uh, as uh, some of our panelists said, they are rather vague, but I did track the uh, person now charged with drawing up uh, or overseeing a full economic policy, who is a very charming and bright, but, uh, but, but is a physicist. And I said, have you ever done anything like drafting economic policies before? And he said, no, never. So that's the kind of approach I think that's been taken. And it's really not, not that much, I think, this election about policy. So all those voters out there are not expecting and not asking, what is your economic policy? What do you propose to do about small and medium enterprises? What do you, these are not questions being asked, or I presume will be asked in the rallies that we might see, right? I, I can't see any voter outcry for, for more detail on policy, but Richard. The Fisheries Federation recently put out a statement calling on all the parties to say what they would do for the fisheries the sector <laughs> and, and they would advise their members to vote accordingly. That's the first time a policy has entered the debate. That is very smart of the Fisheries Federation. No, yeah, uh, I'm Gwen, don't forget I was a physicist until 1973. All right, I'm not having a go at physicists. <laughs> I'm sure they're very smart. Well, th thank you very much. I, I think as far as the economic platform it will come out because uh, as you know there are a lot of strong demands for SME at the moment so policy related SME must be in the platforms of political small or big I think that's one issue and the other things that will come out I think is the how can Myanmar integrated with AEC even though it will not be the main sort of uh, platform but it will uh, come in related uh, that's how Myanmar uh, integrate with the rest of Southeast Asia. And I think just one observation on the military. Myanmar is learning from TNI, Indonesia. It takes 15 years for Indonesia to find out that uh, you can do outside uh, things outside the barracks, become president, become other things, you know. So I think um, uh, Myanmar, Tatmado is learning very fast. Yeah, the name is Nirmal Kosh. I'm with the Straits Times, uh, regional correspondent. I'm just curious, could you, could someone say something about the role of institutions uh, in the country? Because normally, of course, in democratic transition, in any transition, well, more so in democracies, um, it is the institutions which are both the watchdogs as well as the shepherds of the transition. And for so many decades, 
as, as we know, the military has been the only real institution of consequence. Now we have the election commission for one thing, we have parliament as well. Um, could you, could someone um, elucidate a little bit about the relative strength of these institutions, what stage they're at vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the personalities involved? Thanks. Could you raise a good question about AEC and the integration? I have a question about uh, FDI. Um, FDI is something that can help from outsider uh, to uh, help boost the standard of living in the country. So as a businessman who see great potential in Myanmar, uh, questions are well, how easy to do business in Myanmar as a foreigner. What, what homework do we need to do before entering? Uh, what regulatory traps that we have to try to uh, stay ourselves uh, to not fall into that, that trap? What, what are the key ingredients, uh, success factor, which are different from investing in other, other countries? Thank you. If uh, there's very little to distinguish the different parties and no clear policies, what do you expect campaigning to look like when these parties go out and hold their rallies and speak to uh, audiences and crowds? What sort of messages will they be conveying? Will they be focusing on the past, on the future? Uh, and what sort of issues, if not policies, will they most emphasize, do you think? Unfettered, like other people, I have no institution to which I belong to. Um, regarding institutions, first, we don't even have a Myanmar word for it. Institution. It's called institution. <laughs> so, I'm joking. Uh, but the trouble is, when you talk about institutions, I'm an institutionalist because I'm afraid of personalities. But the trouble is, institutions usually at the earlier stage are personalities in disguise. <laughs> so in the case of Myanmar, I would say that. But who are the personalities? Well, if you look at the parliament, you see all those personalities like Aung San Suu Kyi, Mr. Shui Man, and so on. If you look at the government institution, of course, the apex, the president, and you look at the uh, other institutions like education, it is a mess. That's what people say. I didn't say it. <laughs> I have been away for so long. I, have, I came out of that institution anyway. Um, yeah, so institutional weakness is a favorite word. It's the most abused word in Myanmar, perhaps, apart from democracy and human rights. Um, everybody talked about it, the World Bank, IMF, ADB, uh, and, and then e and then AI, we might want to talk about it. Institution building, capacity building. Um, I, I'm confused myself about institutions in Myanmar. So I think uh, that everybody pays lip service to institutions as well. And people always are unable to distinguish between organizations, agencies, and institutions. Parties as an institution, yes. Political system as an institution, but individual parties. Very weak organization. It's organization, it's not institution. And I think until and unless people are sure about that, we can't talk about it. We are talking at cross purposes. Uh, what, what do we talk about FDI? I'm sorry, the gentleman, because if I know the answer, I will be very rich and back home in Myanmar. Because there's a lot of, it depends on what sector, what area, what business, who are you dealing with, right? It is better than before, that everybody says. But it may, sometimes it may take very short if you are in a certain area of business. It will take very long if you are in another area of business. If you are bringing in $50,000, it may be something. If you are bringing in $500 million, it may be different. If you are going to employ 2,000 people or 20 people, highly trained, untrained, bringing your own. So it is very much a case like uh, no size fits all. So it is basically all the rules, most of the rules are there on the web and everything, but it doesn't tell all, of course, as usual. There's a World Bank reports and all these business consultancy reports. All the four big uh, business houses, Ernst and Young and everything, are there already. So you have to pay a lot for them. But the thing is that those ratings, I would like to say a bit about ratings. All these uh, easy to do business, transparency, uh, international, they are perceptions. They are not criteria based on objective performance like MDGs or whatever. So much of them are biased because of the past, and most of them, I think Myanmar is under rated or whatever you call it or overrated well, I mean the rankings are the number is the bigger the number the worse but the Myanmar should be a few maybe a few scores above than those because the problem is we don't know we start from minus 
So I think these ratings are not that great to go by. It's good to write a research paper based on that, but it's not for real business, I would say, because of the perception. And then we, are, we don't even have a credit rating, right? We are now talking about credit rating. And the Japanese are trying to do it because they have to get this ODA and, and business, and they have to have a rating, and the Japanese agency assigned to it would like to have it talk to me, talk to everybody, go say on everybody, and they are still haven't come up with a rating, apart from the standard and poor and other type of things. The Japan, uh, what you call bank for international or whatever thing. So uh, it is a very difficult thing about business atmosphere. Some say great, some say bad, some say really bad. So it depends on whom you talk to. But of course, you, you will need l less and less of the middleman nowadays. There's the most of the one-stop shops. The problem with one-stop shops or one-stop thing is that it stops there before it, it makes you run. So that, that has to be overcome. Um, the final one about uh, what you call um, the campaigning. Of course, we don't know. But most likely that they will talk on popular topics. And they will probably dwell on the past mistakes of the current government and then say, vote for us, we will bring change. Change is probably the buzzword. Change for the better or worse, hopefully for the better. I think that's the only way they can they do. The platforms will not be that sophisticated at all. And, and I think that that's, and of course they will promise this and that for the localities. That's a local politics. So on, uh, on institutions, I defer to uh, uh, Tsiaten, I, I agree. I mean, what I would say is that Myanmar has often been described uh, as having, uh, you know, as a weak state. And I think this has always been a mistake. I think it, as I think it was Mary Callahan first pointed out, and, and I very much agree, you know, uh, Myanmar had a strong state, but a very brittle state and maybe a misguided state, but it was never a weak state. So, you know, a lot of outside organizations, once Myanmar opened up, have come in with a state building agenda as if Myanmar is a sort of conflict affected country like South Sudan, where you need to to re build a state de novo or, or, or rebuild a state. And I think that's, uh, that, that's a, very much the wrong way of looking at things. But that's not to say that all of the institutions are strong, um, of, of course. Um, on business, I mean, I think, yeah, it's a very mixed picture, but uh, clearly Myanmar is never going, is, is not at its current stage of opening going to be the easiest place to do business. Uh, it hasn't had much experience with foreign businesses with FDI and so on, other than, than uh, um, uh, the Chinese and other regional varieties. So, um, you know, the legal and regulatory environment is still very weak and it's still very much in flux. So you'll have to deal with a Companies Act from 1908, is it? At the same time as you're dealing with a, with a, with a you know, a recently written uh, special economic zone law from 2013. Uh, and by the way, the recent uh, foreign direct, direct investment law uh, is being revised after a couple of years to merge it with the local direct investment law. So. You know, th th there's no, uh, uh, yet, uh, no strong stability in terms of the legal and regulatory environment. Um, you know, things like arbitration, things like uh, patent enforcement, trademarks, all of those things, very difficult. Um, but on the other hand, huge opportunities and, and a lot of interest and so, and a very quickly changing environment. Um, on campaigning, yes, I think it'll be buzzwords uh, and it'll be personalities, personalities and identities. If you're an ethnic party, it'll be, you know, I'm Shan or we're, we're the Shan party or we're one of the Shan parties, you're Shan, vote for us. Um, for the NLD, it's already very clear. The NLD uh, throughout this year has been replacing its party signboards all over the country. Uh, and it has the, the name of the party and the township or, or village office or whatever. And on one side, it has General Long San's picture. And on the other side, it has uh, Dorong Sansuchi's picture. And the message is very, very clear. Remember him. Remember how wonderful he wouldn't he would have been. Uh, you know. Remember her and how wonderful she is. This is the party that brings you both. And I think that's the very clear message. And, and I think you know it'll be very much campaigning on that uh, change and and cashing in on the hope and expectation around uh, around Ong San Suu Kyi. So identity and personality politics, I think, uh, very very clearly. Turn your light, please. Uh, in terms of institution building. Uh, the institutions are there. New institutions were created. Uh, some are still being created, and then the, the, some or the many old institutions uh, they're continued. So, I mean, here it's it's not that much about creating new institutions, but more about adjusting to the new setting. So that whether people or that, that who are a part of the, these institutions, whether 
they can adjust themselves to uh, to the new setting uh, quickly, efficiently, and effectively or not. So, like when we look at that, the parliament, regardless of all the problems, uh, the, the, they have the, the when, in terms of, from the perspective of check and balance, they have done a pretty decent job. Uh, even though, like you know, they should have been a little more constructive in some areas, but they have done it. Judiciary has been like criticized by the, uh, 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 like by every, like you know every group at, or every citizen in the country. But uh, to be fair to them, I have interviewed a number of judges. What they said to me is, yes, judiciary is weak. But we are trying to change it, uh, change it, and we're trying to improve it. But, like you know, we don't really get assistance from anybody. Even the answer Suji keeps criticizing. She doesn't give a solution either. What should we do? We are willing to try. Um, uh, the biggest problem is going to be bureaucracy. So the the, 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 the bureaucracy is quite big, uh, and then uh, it's not necessarily because of the political system itself, but, but because of the education. Our education system uh, was good and still is quite weak. So it didn't and still doesn't prepare people to be qualified bureaucrats. But some try to learn uh, the, uh, the, 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 while doing their, their work. Uh, but partly because of that, I mean, the, the, because of their weak capacity, they don't want to take the risk. They don't want to take the uh, responsibility. And then one uh, in and dealing with the, like the more open media, social media network, uh, and then also civil society, they they, are, they have become less and less courageous about uh, taking the, 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 the doing daring things. So the, the the bureaucracy needs a lot more work. Uh, and then now it's at the local level, the government has introduced. Uh, three committee system, which is community leaders became a part of the decision making process. There are three different committees, including uh, the, 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 the township level municipal committee. Uh, so, the bureau, bureau and civil servants and ad, administrators, when they are being monitored by these people, in some areas they became, they didn't become more effective, they became less and less effective because they didn't want to take the responsibility and they didn't do it. So, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the military is still the, the, like, you know, the most organized institution, but still, as I'm cautiously optimistic, I think, uh, we'll, I mean, the institutions we now see today is better than the, the, the they were three years ago. But three years from now, they can only get better. So that's how I will look at it. Um, the, uh, the question on, uh, on, on FDI, and both Richard and Siate have answered that question, and I don't think I have anything new to add to it. And then the party platforms, like, you know, uh, uh, as my colleagues have already said, people will talk, will talk about both past and present identity, Eth uh, ethnic political parties, as Richard said, uh, they will talk more about identity. NLD will talk more about the brand, like you know, the Aung City brand. Like uh, the, the South again, I just hope that they know the difference between confidence and cockiness. Uh, and USDP will talk about continuity of the, and then like you know, the rest will talk about changes, but. You will be surprised there will be some smaller political parties uh, that are also placed more emphasis on the continuity of current reform process. So well, we're going to, we now have, like, you know, a large number of political parties. So, like, you know, you name it, at least one party will talk about it. Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, I will differ from all of you uh, in one point. I think in the past 18 years, when Myanmar joined ASEAN, there is a large group of bureaucrats being trained to be ASEANites. And nobody mentioned about this. This will be a new force because of everything integrative effort across cutting of the three pillars. You cover all so socioeconomics, political, security. I think. 
people underrated Myanmar ASEAN bureaucrat for the past 18 years is the most trained they have been given training over trained I would argue in the past year. and that they have delivered they have delivered when they are when they were chairman last year they deliver for the wrong reason I would say because uh, uh, they trying to give in to the all uh, uh, demand, so that's why they have the longest uh, joint communicate about uh, uh, twelve uh, thousand word. Normally, it's seven thousand word. So I think uh, in this area, you will see that uh, this bureaucrat, their new driving force. For example, they try to integrate it uh, in areas like green economy. Of course, people love at it, you know. And for example, on human rights protection, people laugh at it because there are a lot of violations. But Myanmar set up a National Human Rights Commission, which has not worked very well, but they have got one anyway. So they try to do all this. They try to increase the protection uh, provision. You have a lot of complaints of uh, national councils, over 6,000. A lot of them about land convictions never give a full address yet. But this kind of mechanism will, I think, increasingly become more visible and integrated with ASEAN. I, I don't think you should ignore this because Myanmar, like any other country, would try to integrate with the rest of ASEAN. And if you look at the FDI of Myanmar, they rank pretty high within ASEAN blueprint. I don't want to mention the core country or the old member of ASEAN. When they come to compliance, they fail. They have not looked uh, as good as a new member. So the argument that uh, new member of ASEAN dragging down economic integration is actually half truth. No, I agree with you. Uh, the, but one thing is, though, when you look at the part Myanmar participants of uh, ASEAN meetings in the last 18 years, they, they're older than the participants from all other countries. So the kind of many of these people have either have retired or they will soon retire. That is the danger. You are right, and I think there are new young generation that that coming in. It's a sort of a rotation thing. There is a little gap. I mean, among those my generation, who are the Asianites, uh, and then the younger ones who have been trained in all over the world, which are in the thirties. So there's a gap at the third echelon, second echelon level. So these guys are still at the rank of assistant directors and things, so they haven't reached DDG director level. So there's a gap which has to be catch up in, in that sense. And another thing is that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, yes, is probably the most tr highly trained and internationalized uh, bureaucracy, but the rest, sadly say, are being trained in a very confusing way. There are so many trainers and so many trainees right. and repeat trainees, and they complain to me, I'm also part of the training system. They say, we have to come to your training course, then go back and work until midnight, right? And Sundays. And then we train on Sundays. Oh my God. And, and then every, each come with a different idea of public administration, blah, 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 and then they, and they get confused and they are overtrained. The ministers are very keen. Go to the training, go to the training everywhere. But the problem is the trainers themselves are probably, some of them are, I'm sorry to say, not real trainers. That, that's a problem. But nobody has said anything yet about relations with the US or China. What would the post-election situation be like? Would, that, would you see a clearer alignment with one side or the other? What do you think about the role of Myanmar Big Business Group, or someone called them crony, uh, both in the changing structure of economics and politics? Well, we don't mention the C and the U word here, because still, again, we are talking about elections. Post-elections, well, it depends on the U.S. again, whether U.S. will be happy with it, and, and who's the next U.S. president, right, and the Congress and everything. So I think not much, not much change, no, no great strides. And the SDN list will remain, right, and SDN list will remain because it's very difficult to remove people from SDN list. And then the military to military interaction will still be minimal, and that's it. U.S. investment still hasn't come. I mean. Why should they come in the first place? <laughs> so uh, it, it will probably be um, much more, perhaps. It depends, again, on the market and, and, and the conditions and so on. China, we have not forsaken China, frankly speaking, despite the fact that there's a groundswell of anti-Chinese sentiments. Unless there's a very populist government came out, 
things will not be much changed again with China. Cronies. I think the best thing is to stop calling them cronies. <laughs> that will help. I'm, but that's not a very popular suggestion. Uh, because in an in a enlightened democracy and, a, and good governance, cronies are no more. They are oxymorons, right? So the past cronies will have to change to become competitive. And some have probably doing it. And, and of course, uh, I don't want to name names. But unless it, I mean, starting from family business to corporate business, and then from cronies and family business to corporate business, and then internationally competitive or regionally competitive, or even have to let go of the monopolies and, and, and the oligopolies. Yes, that, that's the way to go. We can't kill them all. We can't uh, make them poor overnight and turn over their assets to the state, which is ridiculous. And, and of course, the popular sentiment is the second option, turn over the, everything to the state, make them poor, poor and run the street. But that's not possible. But they do have to be enlightened themselves. I think they do. They do know they are quite smart at, at sensing this situation. So I think they will still be there. But like, uh, unlike what happened to the Chabals, uh, you know, when they were completely, uh, you know, split up, I, it won't happen yet. It won't happen yet. Privatization is another hot potato too. It's going to come up again. Yes, I agree. I mean, the idea that uh, Myanmar could ever move too far from China, is, if you look at the map, is is, is ridiculous. And, and you know, despite the fact that some uh, in the more paranoid end of the Chinese foreign policy community in Beijing see the U.S. hand in everything and, and worry that Myanmar is going to forsake them, you know, I think the more moderate voices uh, in Beijing have it right. Uh, China, you know, Myanmar is not going anywhere. Um, but it's about rebalancing. It's about rebalancing what was in the past a heavily imbalanced uh, relationship. Uh, and that wasn't good for Myanmar, and it wasn't good for China either. And, and, and so it's, it's a healthy rebalancing. Um, what will happen after the elections in, uh, in terms of US relations depends on whether we're talking about the Myanmar elections or the US elections. Because uh, Myanmar is shaping up to be quite an important part of the foreign policy debate in the US elections. Uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, big uh, problem is uh, Benghazi, and her uh, claim to success is Burma. And so the two Bs are going to dominate uh, uh, foreign policy uh, issues in the US presidency. And so I don't see. Uh, so, so that means that the appetite for bad news from Myanmar will still be very strong after these elections uh, until the U.S. elections are out of the way. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, if, if Aung San Suu Kyi comes out of, of, these, uh, of these polls messaging positively, uh, if the general sense is that they were largely credible and inclusive, uh, then I think it will trigger uh, some sort of policy shift. It will make it a lot easier uh, for the U.S. government to do the kinds of things that it's been wanting to do for some time, but has has been hamstrung on. And, I, and yes, I agree, no end to the SDN list, but maybe a slightly faster removal of people. Uh, we'll see more in terms of military to military relationships. Uh, n nothing um, uh, kinetic, as the military guys say. No weapons, offensive weapons, but certainly IMET uh, training would be on the cards. I think. Um, in terms of the cronies, yes, they never were cronies, and so they're certainly not cronies now. They were more proxies, uh, as seems to be the, the, the more accurate term to use. But, you know, uh, they were among the first to shift. They saw which way the winds were blowing before almost anybody else did uh, early in 2011 and started claiming themselves, two of them at least, as sons of 1988, uh, uh, you know, sidling up to the NLD. Um, they saw which way things were going. and, and um, uh, you know, they can be not only uh, problematic in terms of their footprint in the economy, but they can be a huge uh, asset for the economy. They have resources, they have capital to invest, uh, large amounts of it, uh, sitting around not doing very much. And so they can be part of an engine of the growth of the economy, as well as a potential uh, problem in terms of, of capitalizing too much. But you know, the, the economy is growing fast enough and div diversifying fast enough and the rules of the game have shifted enough that their footprint won't shrink, but the rest of the economy will grow around it. And so I don't see them, uh, neither them nor the military, actually, as having uh, a controlling interest in a future Myanmar economy. Still big players, but not the dominant players. These days, when people ask uh, senior Burmese uh, government officials, what their foreign policy is, the unanimous answer most people will get 
Yes, we are practicing multiple alliance policy. We don't just rely on one country. So that's what you, that they would say. The, the, in the past, the, 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 they didn't have a choice but rely on China a lot. But now they want to, uh, the, the, they want to be able to work with uh, the, all the different countries that could benefit the country, yeah, that is Myanmar. So uh, with U.S., I don't really foresee any major changes uh, because there's one problem. When President Obama came to Myanmar for the first time, the order of the issues they discussed was political reforms, the peace, pro peace process, and the Rakhine issue. But the order has been then upside down. The Rakhine issue is now number one in the U.S. Myanmar relations. So that problem, even even what, after we have a new government, I don't think will be resolved quickly. So the kind of this will uh, this will be uh, an issue that will uh, influence U.S. Myanmar relations. So uh, I mean, like if things go well with the elections. The, Chances are, as Richard said, the, the, world, the, the United States would give more assistance. And then also, we might see the military to military relations. But at the same time, the way things are going, I think it will take time. With China, we need to distinguish between anti Chinese, growing anti Chinese sentiment, and Sino Myanmar relations. A growing anti-Chinese sentiments has more to do with uh, the movement of ethnic Chinese from northern Myanmar and northeastern Myanmar to city areas than China itself. China does play a small role, but these, the, the, these Chinese who live outside the control of, uh, in the areas that, uh, that were outside the control of the central government, uh, they were they were more Chinese than Burmese, like uh, ethnic Chinese who live in, uh, in in the government control areas. They went through the kind of socialization we went through. We went to the same school because no private schools were allowed. Uh, the, partly because of that, even the way that their diet is more Burmese than the the new Chinese. What the the, the people that the, the, who were referred to as new Chinese. They know they didn't come from mainland China uh, recently. They came. They have been inside the Myanmar for a long time, and but they were out. They didn't socialize with the mainstream society for a long time until like mid the 1990s or early 2000s. So these people, uh, the Burmese is not very fluent, and then like you know, both Burmese and ethnic Chinese uh, who grew up uh, in city areas think that these people are rude, they're rich, but they're rude, and then like, you know, they don't respect others. But the thing is, they're not well integrated into the mainstream society. But another problem is their children not go to private schools. When you look at in Mandalay, uh, the, the, uh, the, when you look at private schools in Mandalay, uh, depending, like in some schools, up to 90% of the schools there are Chinese. And then these people are not going, these young people are going through a different socialization process. And then they, they, they talk down and look down upon uh, the, the Bama and uh, other non Bama ethnic minorities. So that, that is the main reason that, that contribute uh, to, to the growing anti Chinese sentiment. With China, of course, there are, like, uh, there are ups and downs, but both sides agree that. Uh, that they need each other. Like, you know, without the government along the border, there will be instability. China doesn't want that. And then at the same time, Myanmar can now, any Myanmar governments, uh, that, that, I mean, the, both future, the past, uh, the present, and future, they cannot afford not to have good relations with China. People are complaining about the release of uh, Chinese illegal loggers recently. And then, like the news has, has, has come out uh, gradually, the, the Burmese, uh, the, the U Teng Sen administration, the Myanmar government has made a deal with the Chinese government. The Myanmar government released uh, these 150 Chinese loggers, illegal loggers, and that the Chinese government, in return, released uh, 250 Burmese uh, but, uh, but, uh, who were 
held in Chinese prisons. They were all released already. And then the China also relaxed the restrictions on uh, rice import from Myanmar. There are a couple of other deals too. So both sides are trying to do the best they can of, uh, in the interest of their own country. I don't really foresee any major changes in Sino-Myanmar relations either. And then the cronies. I, I wrote my dissertation on cronyism in Myanmar. But back then, that, uh, like in the 90s, uh, of course, I was very critical of them. But at the same time, when you look at state business relations in Myanmar, the thing is, they, need, they needed each other and they still need each other. So, in the past, one a military the, the ministers or some senior military leaders travel around the country, that and the business people would accompany him. Uh, all them. Then, like you know, every time these military officers or ministers wanted to make some donation at the local level, uh, that like the, these business people, they would accompany these senior government officers with huge stack of money, and then like you know, the money would come from these business people. At one point in the night, sometime in the 2000s, I was I happened to be in one area, and I knew one of the people. A businessman in the group. I was standing with them, with him, with him. I met that person uh, was not with his assistant, so he didn't have, he didn't carry any money. And then suddenly they did, they needed the money, and then only like about half a million chat. And I got the money, so I gave it to them. I loaned the money to them, and then so that I started asking them. But right now is these they're like you know whatever you call them, prousies or cronies, like you know, in a lot of ways, Richard is absolutely right, correct. Like you know, they're more proxies than cronies. So, but like you know, the, these business people, they, they, they're smart enough to understand that uh, they will not survive, uh, like you know, if they remain, uh, if they are still label us cronies. The, up to now, there's only one person who proudly said that, that he was proud to be a crony. One person, like I just said, that, like you know, he did. He made the mistake of saying, saying it in front of a political historian. I would not write about it now, but later I will write about it. Uh, but other than that, all others are really trying uh, to, to detach themselves from that label. And then some are doing pretty good jobs. The whole thing started, if you want a date, on the day, uh, no, not on the day, a day after the, the president and uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi had their first meeting. Uh, the next day, the Aung San Suu Kyi came to this conference on economic development. We were both there. And uh, the, the, the first day, I, I, they asked me to talk about state business relations, so I basically was very, very critical of this, the whole crony the capitalism in Myanmar. The second day, Dosu came, and then, uh, and then she was invited to this tea reception during the breakup before she left. All the cronies lined up to, to her. And then, like, you know, and then some of them came and talked to me. Hey, bro, do you know, we work really hard. We're not the kind of people that you mentioned in your presentation. Come and talk to us. I want to talk to you. Just tell us. And then, that was the first day. I know, what the I, I know the person Richard was referring to. These two people, like you know, tried to came up a sense of eighty eight generation. That was the day. One of that those two people asked Dosu to come to this function. I'm not going to say what he regularly so organizes, and at which. She obliged. She went to one of those functions. So people are trying right now. Like you know, how did NLD support its uh, activities from these people, the people who are known to be cronies under the previous regimes? So we'll just have to wait and see. The country would collapse. The economy would collapse if all their businesses were nationalized. That's for sure. So they're gonna. We will just wait. We'll just have to ensure that. These people will really change the way they run the business. It was quite interesting when uh, talking to the president that he uh, spent quite a lot of time on international relations. And uh, again, with his 
sort of vision going forward, I think he he put great stress and emphasis to say that China remained very much a friend and pointed out that it was still number one investor, uh, very um, happy with the, the normalization with and warming ties with the US, but still um, concerns about the, the remaining um, sanctions. And then very much stressed the role of India and said, we mustn't forget India. We're sandwiched between these big powers. We must have good relations with them all. And it was very clear that, you know, the vision is something about Myanmar entering uh, a new phase of further expansion of, of relations and of course bringing Japan on very much to um, to help fund a lot of the projects and uh, I'll leave it at that. Well, I, I want to add from what uh, Gwen is saying, don't forget Thailand oh, because yeah. don't one don't of the Thailand. most country will be affected by the elections in Myanmar is Thailand. For the first time in Thai history in its relation with Myanmar we will have democratic rival. And with that, I'd like to leave you with no conclusion. I think we have done a great job <laughs> with all the speakers who have previews, give you all the prospect and all the talking point you ever wanted about what is coming. And didn't want. <laughs> and didn't want. Okay, and one thing, when Myanmar, this is one thing I learned being a Myanmar watcher from Thailand, when Myanmar decided on a road map, they pursue it to finale until it finish. Unlike the Thai, we have hundreds of road map. Once we have one obstacle, we change. <laughs> Having said that, I hope you agree with me that uh, all the panelists have done a great, great job. And please give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. And thank you for the sponsor for giving this uh, uh, Kind.